Uh, right, um, welcome one and all for a discussion with Professor Nancy Ferber. Uh, we are the Salis Properly Foundation, a student organization at Yale with the ambition to offer undergraduates an avenue to engage with the many facets of international development and welfare maximizing policy formation. I would, I would like to thank the Yale Economic Growth Center and the Bruce L. Cohen Research Award for the generous support without which this event would not have been possible. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Ferber. Mm -hmm. Professor Ferber is Professor Emirata of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and served as president of the International Association of Feminist Economics from 2002 to 2003. She's also been an associate editor for the journal Feminist Economics since 1995, and she's also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Women, Politics, and Policy. Ferber is a pioneer of feminist economics, and her research studies the relationship between political economy and feminist theory, with an emphasis on unpaid, unpaid care work. Ferber's books include Self Love, the, Main, the Mainspring, a feminist critique of political economy, The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, For Love and Money and Greed, Lust and Gender. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Ferber. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. Everybody. So, Bilal, how much time do we have? Do we have like an hour? An hour, yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, so happy to see all of you. I got a chance to get introductions from some beforehand. You know, we're a relatively small group, so I think it would be much more fun if we could make this a really interactive um, exchange rather than just um, a performance. So I'm going to uh, just uh, give you a little bit of an intro to uh, my work and a book that I'm working on called Accounting for Care. And then I'm going to pause and see if you have questions or comments that you want to build on. And then, if uh, it feels appropriate, I can go into a little bit more kind of technical detail and tell you a little bit about my empirical research. But I think it would be better just to start with some really big ideas. Um, so I really love um, the name of the group, Salus Populi, because I think economic development should be about improving the health and well-being of the global population, not about expanding or maximizing gross domestic product, uh, which has come under a lot of criticism in recent years, but still remains kind of the basic scoreboard by which um, success and failure are judged in the economic arena. And I think it's um, uh, not just an inaccurate measure, but actually a really seriously misleading measure of economic development and welfare, in particular because it focuses entirely on market output, on things that are bought and sold. And in the world we live in, there are a lot of uh, things that seem to be approaching a kind of crisis that are not bought and sold in markets. So climate change is one uh, really big example of that. We know that a lot of the sources of climate change lie in the fact that uh, public goods and public bads are a byproduct of the process of creating GDP. I think we might do better if we close the door, just because there's a little uh, backstop. So uh, care work, which I define as the production and the development and the maintenance of human capabilities, is a little bit like the natural environment. It's something that goes on outside, largely outside, but not completely outside. The market economy is very much affected by the market economy. And um, we also see some signs of crisis in uh, the social climate, of which uh, some examples would be uh, increased rates of death from uh, drug addiction, from alcoholism, and from suicide in the US, often referred to as quote unquote deaths of despair. And also there's a lot of evidence that people in the US, as in other affluent countries, are having many fewer children than they would prefer to have because they see the cost of raising children as being really, really overwhelming. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a world where average birth rates are the value of unpaid care work, you know what I mean when I say unpaid care work, it's basically housework, caring for children, caring for the elderly, volunteering in the community, um, all things that are really indispensable to kind of daily living standards, right? And uh, we call them work because in principle somebody could be paid to do it, but in fact a lot of people do it 
without uh, any uh, economic reward, and so what are the um, what are the consequences of it? So when I say when I define care as the production and development and maintenance of human capabilities, that should remind you of a phrase you've probably heard in other contexts, which is human capital. And human cap human capital is a part of human capabilities. But usually when economists talk about human capital, what they're talking about is the acquisition of educational credentials or experience that increases earnings. So human capital is really oriented towards what are the resources that can increase future earnings. And my goal is to reverse that um, line of thinking and instead think about how GDP and market income do or do not improve the the value of human capabilities. I think human capabilities have intrinsic value, and they also have value in the market via human capital. And uh, uh, they also have value um, for the performance of non-market work. That is, I would hope that education not only improves your market earnings, but improves your ability to be a good parent, to be a good citizen, to be uh, um, to be, you know, a good person, um, and uh, somehow we we want to develop a methodology for better social accounting of these aspects of um, of care provision. So, um, Bilal was referring to me as a feminist economist, and it's true. I have been very influenced by feminist theory, and a lot of feminist theory comes into my work, and I'll tell you how and why, but um, I want to emphasize from the start that I consider myself kind of a hybrid, heterodox economist. I don't, I don't like labels, like this person is in this school, and this person is in that school, and this person is in this school. To me, the really interesting value added in uh, scholarly research comes from combining different things in different ways and seeing uh, what kind of synergies emerge. So um, let me just tell you briefly what I think the uh, some of the important things I've plucked from feminist theory are. So number one is this idea that unpaid work is also work and that we should consider its value and we should consider its consequences. And there's a long history of feminist efforts uh, to uh, uh, make this happen. It starts in the late 19th century. And this is an example of something we can go back to, and I can tell you that I can lay out the historical narrative in more detail if you're interested in it. But it, it does have a really uh, long, long history. And then a second thing that I pull from feminist theory is that um, the the conventional economic emphasis on self-interest. People pursue their self-interest, they maximize their utility, they, you know, they just want more individual satisfaction. Often implies that people have no concern for others and that's not a problem and actually it's a good thing if people pursue their self-interest because everybody benefits. This is kind of a traditional litany of economics and um, feminist economists have long been critical of it and in part because it's not a principle that helps explain the production or the development or the creation of human capabilities. That is, if you don't really care about somebody, if you don't have some concern for their well-being, you're not likely to do a very good job as a teacher or as a doctor or as a parent. So actually, I would say interdependent preferences, concern for others, is actually economically indispensable. We can't run an efficient economy without some level of concern for the well-being of others. So, I don't know, maybe in the history of feminist thought, you've come across references to uh, equality versus difference. And equality is the notion that, you know, women should become, should have the, the, the space, the rights uh, to be, to act as though, act in the same way that men do that they should have access to that masculine world. But the difference 
approach of feminism has always said, well, wait a minute, there's some things about femininity that are really good that we should value and, and, um, and, and respect and treasure. And so finding a balance between those two is, I think, a consistent theme in feminist theory. How do we balance self-interest with concern for others? And it's not an easy task, either on the individual level or on the social level. So I'm not going to solve this issue of balance for you. I'm just going to say I think it's it's an animating idea within feminist economics that's that's really uh, that's really relevant. And um, the interesting thing about care provision, I think, in, in sort of economic terms, is that it provides enormous public benefits kind of spillover benefits, uh, a more educated, healthier uh, people, citizenry creates, uh, leads to better economic outcomes and better outcomes overall, but it's individually quite costly. And why is it costly? Well, because even though you might derive a lot of intrinsic satisfaction from it, you don't get much economic reward. And why don't you get much economic reward? Well, part of the reason is you're producing a public good something that creates value for the person you're caring for, for everybody they come in contact with, uh, for their future role as a parent, etc. So there are all these spillover multiplier effects of care provision that can't be individually captured. So, um, you know, you hear in an economics class that workers are paid their marginal product. Well, what's my marginal product right now? Pretty hard to measure, huh? I mean, theoretically, it's what it's an increment in your capabilities that I am creating that is not just about imparting knowledge, but it's also imparting a sense of curiosity and commitment um, to solving certain problems. And, you know, I can't claim it that. I can't measure it and I can't claim it. So teaching, like a lot of other care jobs, requires intrinsic motivation because there is no extrinsic payoff, right? And that gives it a kind of uh, a very distinctive character. And it also uh, creates this kind of parallel between the positive externalities of care provision, um, which may be discouraged when we don't reward it adequately, and the negative externalities of environmental change, which can create climate disaster if we don't figure out a way to, to counter them. So um, the final kind of uh, piece of the feminist argument here is that a lot of gender inequality derives from women's specialization in care provision. And in fact, in the US, in particular, if you look at the earnings of men and women who are not married and have no children, there is no gender wage differential. Almost all of the gender wage differential emerges later as a result of for children or to care for elderly family members. And also over time as a result of women choosing jobs in the care sector of the economy, which pay less than other jobs, partly because they're creating public goods. Okay, so that's a little bit of an overview, and now I'm gonna just uh, wanna hear from you about what uh, parts of the story you'd like me to elaborate on. Or you can ask me about a completely unrelated thing if you like, uh, but let's make it more interactive, yeah. Two questions which are slightly divergent. One is that we'd love to hear a little bit more about the early 19th century feminist efforts in okay. the okay. The second thing is, uh, do you have recommendations for what public uh, finance, what tax policy should look like in order to ameliorate sure. some of these Okay, issues. great. Those are two. Yeah, yeah. good too. Really, really great. Okay. So I'll tell you a story about the the uh, late, late 19th century U.S. So I, I was uh, working on a project about measuring, um, estimating women's market work in Massachusetts in the late 19th century. And as a result, I was uh, reading this huge book by Carol Wright called The History and Growth of the U.S. Census. It was a really rainy day, and I was just dying of boredom. And I was just basically like 
do you ever do this with a book? You just like you just want to extract what you need from it. You don't want to like <laughs> suffer through the whole thing. So I actually looked in the index under women. I thought, okay, this this is all I want. I'm just gonna look. If he doesn't say about <laughs> women, I am not, not interested. Okay. So I see in the index letter of protest by the Association of University Women um, uh, concerning the lack of remuneration for women's work. And I'm like, what? What? How is this possible? And I find this reference to this feminist group that in 1878 protested to Congress that the census didn't consider housewives uh, as occupied, as making any productive contribution. And I thought, I got to see this letter. I, I got this letter. I mean, <laughs> I had never seen any references to this letter before. Okay. So I. Um, get on my bicycle and I go to the UMass library and find a government documents librarian because back in the day there was no Google Scholar. <laughs> and the reference librarian has to go through like a card catalog, you know, like this class is on, you know, can I find this? And he says, oh, here it is, but we don't have it here. You'll have to go to the Amherst College Library to find it. So uh, get on my bike and I go to the Amherst College Library, which is just a couple of miles away from the UMass Library. And there they have archives in this basement that um, is also a fallout shelter. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it was set up to be like a community fallout shelter back in the day of fear of nuclear war. And the uh, books are on moving shelves. Do you have any libraries here with, where there are moving shelves? The, the, the books are all packed together, so if you want to look for something on a shelf, you have to press a button and move one shelf down, and then press another button, move one shelf down, press another button. Move, and so it's like this robotic uh, system. So I finally get to the uh, place where the um, volume of government documents that I want is, and the light bulb is burnt out. There is no way I can see the uh, call numbers on these dusty tones. And so I go upstairs and tell the librarian, and she says, oh, don't worry, there'll be a maintenance worker next week. And I can't wait till next week. <laughs> so I go downstairs, and I notice that there's a ladder in the corner, and I take the ladder and climb up and unscrew a light bulb that works, and I go back and screw it in, and I and I find the volume. And it's a really, there is this letter of protest, and it goes into a lot of detail. It sounds like a modern, it sounds like something out of a modern protest, that, uh, you know, here is the census. First of all, they don't hire any women to do, uh, to participate in census taking, which is unfair. And secondly, they treat, um, housewives as though they have no occupation and make no contribution, and this is obviously unfair. And it turns out that, that this leads me on a path uh, of historical research in which I learned that the census of Great Britain in 1851 actually did count housewives as occupied in a separate occupation. Um, and it treated rich people who just lived off their... Um, off their capital and earnings that didn't actually work uh, uh, in a separate category uh, uh, in which, you know, that, that designated them as non-workers. And um, then I learned that, that the state of Massachusetts had conducted a state census in which they followed the practices of the British census. So the Massachusetts state census in 1871 um, actually enumerated the number of housewives. And guess what? Uh, didn't automatically assume that women were housewives if they didn't have a paying job. It asked them if they were actively engaged in housework. And if they said no, it put them in a separate category called wives merely ornamental. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. It, it, you know, and furthermore, some men reported that they were uh, engaged in housework uh, 
because they were, you know, it wasn't there wasn't this assumption made uh, about it. Now, uh, why didn't this practice persist? Why did it die out? Well, largely because economists challenged it, and in particular, Alfred Marshall, the eminent English economist at Cambridge, uh, pronounced that this was distorting the uh, picture of the uh, labor force and that Great Britain and by inference Massachusetts should follow the practices um, of the German census which described housewives as dependents. Well think about the meaning of dependent. A housewife is dependent, that implies she's not doing anything. She's just being entirely supported by someone else that is kind of a rationalization for denying women rights, uh, property rights, rights over their own earnings, so forth and so on. So there's a real ideological kind of uh, uh, tilt to this whole statistic evolution of all these statistical categories. But the story continues through the, the 20th century. So every once in a while, somebody raises their hand and says, wait a minute, we could count housework and we could assign a value to it and they do it and then it gets forgotten. And then somebody raises it again and it gets forgotten. So there's one estimate published in 1920, there's another estimate published in 1940, there's another estimate suddenly in the 1970s, there's a feminist movement, there's kind of a global women's movement that gets very oriented towards uh, thinking about time use and valuing unpaid work, and suddenly countries start collecting data, and now we have regular time use surveys in the US uh, that tell us how much time people spend cooking, how much time they spend looking after kids, how much time they spend looking after elderly, so forth and so on, how much time they spend taking out the garbage, how much time they spend doing gardening, how much time they spend, you know, uh, washing dishes. And if you look at those numbers today, which are kind of the fruit of this centuries-long effort to actually measure it, to count it, to value it, what you see is that in the U.S., which is one of the most affluent countries in the world, about half of all labor time is unpaid. Half of the total. And that's because people go home after their jobs and they do work. They go shopping, they make dinner, they wash the dishes. There's still a fair number of women who specialize in unpaid work or housewives. A lot of retirees are doing unpaid work and not engaging in paid employment. And a lot of students, like yourselves, are uh, not engaging in a lot of paid work, but are still kind of doing some level of unpaid work. So half, half of all labor hours in the US are, are unpaid. So it has a big impact on standards of living. All right, that was kind of a long story. That was the history part. Yeah? I guess how do you sort of quantify or I guess compensate rather these labor hours that are unpaid? Uh, I guess we can't, like, is the idea to maybe set up some sort of like government fund and give people money. Well, wait a minute, but make a distinction between, there's a difference between estimating the value and actually paying for it. Right. Okay, so the way it's estimated or imputed is generally, um, it's generally done following the logic of the definition of work. You could pay someone in principle to do it for you. Okay, so that's called a replacement cost method. And it could be a very specific replacement cost, like for childcare, what would you pay a childcare worker? For cooking, what would you pay a chef? For uh, doing laundry, what would you pay a domestic servant? At best, that gives you a lower bound, a very crude estimate of the value, and it's just based on that counterfactual. What would you have to pay someone to do it? And um, it's better than nothing, because if you don't assign that value, you're, you're, even if you don't do that estimate, you're assigning a value to it. It's just that the value is zero, mm -hmm. which is clearly less correct than a minimum bound estimate. So now there are a lot of estimates of the value of unpaid work in the U.S., and there are what are called satellite accounts 
for the U.S. and other countries that show you how much bigger gross domestic product would be if you added in the value of unpaid work. And they, they're constructed as satellites because uh, no one wants to uh, create a total discontinuity in national income figures because you want to have consistent figures over time. But by adding in but keeping separate this um, estimate of the value of non-market work, you can get a better picture. And here's what's interesting. The same thing is happening with environmental accounts. That is, uh, a lot of economists are out there estimating the value of ecological services and uh, like uh, pollination. Uh, pollination that's performed by insects, basically, at no cost. What would, it, what would we have to pay if all the bees in the world disappeared, which is, by the way, not a completely far-fetched possibility at this point, right? And then natural assets, uh, you know, when you, when you cut down a forest, you sell the timber, but you've also lost the ability of those trees to regenerate, right? So you've depleted an asset. Or when you deplete global fisheries below uh, a replacement rate level, you've depleted a capital stock. So accounting used to be like a really boring field, and it has become an arena for really creative thinking about how to value both care and environmental assets and, and, and um, um, processes. Yeah? Um, I thought you, you said this was a very crude way to think about valuing care, and it sounds like you're writing a book about maybe better ways to do that. And I'm curious sort of what beyond the crude ways you're thinking about with valuing it, or is that the best you can do? And it ties in a little bit to what you said earlier, which is this really important point you made in your work so powerfully that so much of care um, can't be measured well. <laughs> like, you know, what are you providing to this room? So you can measure yeah, yeah. changing a diaper because that's done over here, you know, yeah. insofar as it's done in the market, but so much of it that's really yeah. in its deepest importance in some ways is, is very, very hard even to observe, much less to measure. And, it gets us into difficult questions about, you know, when we try right. to measure you know, how good a teacher is, for example. That's right. extremely hard. So, so right. I'm curious anything about... Okay, but before, yeah. before I go there, just notice that the same problems come in with natural assets. Uh, that what we, uh, the only thing that we have for thinking about the deterioration of the natural climate are also very crude uh, estimates. And a lot of those things are also invisible. And that is, that is actually, that is very much the challenge. So... Um, in terms of alternative estimates uh, or alternative methodologies, there are a bunch of different stages that I, I'm trying to explain in the book. One is, I think that the, the, the data that we have on time use, while it's very valuable, doesn't really capture a lot of really important time. Um, and in particular, it doesn't accurately capture childcare time because the surveys only measure time that you spend actually doing something physical with a child, like bathing a child, feeding a child, uh, reading aloud to a child, uh, that counts. But the supervisory constraints of having to be physically present in the home when there is a child under the age of 13 there are, are largely ignored. So most estimates of childcare are far too low. So I've been involved in a lot of efforts to improve uh, the methodology of the of the tiny surveys. Then the replacement cost, well, uh, uh, getting as specific as possible about the wage rates that, that one thinks are, are accurate and providing both upper and lower bound estimates, sort of trying to do a robustness check of replacement costs are, are really relevant, I think. Um, a big issue that um, I haven't figured out a solution to is substitutability. I think there, there is some substitutability between money and time, right? If you have more money, you can hire people to do stuff for you, or you can buy, you know, you can buy takeout instead of cooking dinner, right? But uh, oddly enough, it just seems like time devoted to non-market work isn't that sensitive to wages. Uh, or to income, and it's almost as though there's a sort of socially necessary amount of labor time 
There's a threshold effect. There are nonlinearities, and there's a, a threshold effect. So looking at how, looking more closely at the relationship between wages and income and time allocation, I think gives us some really important clues. And then, um, The really intangible stuff you have to get at by some kind of uh, measures of community health and uh, community, how that relates to family structure and family time use and family participation. And I think that's really hard. But the uh, trying to, th uh, uh, well, a an example that I was talking to earlier to, to Bill all uh, about is um, there's a, a genre of work that looks at the effect of exogenous economic shocks on physical health. And I think this in itself is a really important area of research that is part of the care economy. So what happened in Russia when the economy was privatized almost overnight and a lot of people lost their jobs? As you probably know, male mortality went way up and a lot of that male mortality was related to deaths from alcoholism and drug addiction. Okay. Another interesting example is what happened during um, the um, austerity policies adopted in a lot of countries around the Great Recession. That also caused a lot of unemployment. And in some countries, it caused a huge spike in mortality, and other countries it didn't cause a big spike in mortality. And there's a really great book uh, called The Body Economic by Stuckler and Basu. Do you know that book? Yeah, yeah, they actually talked to you. Okay, yeah. so so it's basically showing that policy, public policy, really was a really important mediator of the impact on our mortality. And then there's recently been a lot of research on. Uh, deaths of despair in the U.S., and it's clearly linked to unemployment and deindustrialization and also inequality. So um, I think one of the things that's been unexplored, underexplored in that literature is the effect of care provision and care uh, commitments on the family and community level. I think that's also a pretty serious mediating force. And one example that I was telling Bilal about is that uh, women seem to be much less vulnerable to deaths of despair than men. So suicide rates in the U.S. are much higher for men, four times higher for men than women. And the demographic group with the lowest uh, suicide rate in the U.S. are black grandmothers, which is kind of a paradox because they're economically really disadvantaged. But what's the difference? They are care providers at the center of a community of mutual aid. And so one thing that I want to explore with my friend who's an expert on Russian um, mortality is whether living in a household um, with children or with dependents actually causes more economic stress but, causes more, but also creates more psychological resilience that it just creates more meaning and more commitment and more courage to deal with everyday stress. And the reason I like this line of reasoning is I think I've often ended up in my work saying a whole lot about the cost of care, the cost of care, the cost of care, gender inequality, it's not fair, women are getting screwed, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also important to see the positive effects. And I think they are reflected in resilience and, and fortitude and connection and solidarity and meaningfulness. And, you know, I don't know, my hypothesis is that men who are not connected, who don't have a partner, who don't, are not parents, don't live near their, you know, who are really disconnected, I believe they are probably much more vulnerable to the effects of unemployment than other men. So I think there's a research agenda there. Um, and the reason that I come and give talks like this is I'm always trying to recruit people to some part of this research agenda. So, raise your hand if, you, if you're ready to sign up. Um, you had asked me about policy stuff. 
You know, I, I'm more of a theorist and an empirical researcher, but I also think that um, a lot of the components of the Build Back Better plan that Democrats put together in the fall really speak very directly to the, the crisis of care. And improvements in our healthcare system really speak to the crisis of care. And that a lot of basic income experiments around the country uh, also speak to this crisis of care. You know, people say, oh, basic income, you know, a, ba a universal basic income would be say, to say that everybody should get a certain level of, of subsistence income no matter what. And, you know, the biggest argument against that is, oh, it's a disincentive to work. Well, it's a disincentive to work for pay, but it's actually an incentive to provide care for family members. Uh, right? So the whole literature of economics, when it talks about incentives, it's all, always about incentives for market work. Oh, that could discourage market work. Well, what about all the disincentives for taking care of family? You know, oh no, I can't. I'll lose my job if I stay. You know, there's. It's really important to think about the supply of unpaid work, just as we think about the supply of paid work. Uh, and it does seem like, if you look at the current landscape, like people really do. It is really important. People, it is a big part of people's lives. It's more, it's half of their time, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. I guess just going off of that, how do you build this like non-market work into a measure of economic well-being? Which you, I guess you mentioned the satellite. How do we convince policymakers that it's actually a good thing? People are spending more time with families or women especially are providing more time for care as it has these positive externalities that are not being measured? Um, well, that's a really good question and I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very frustrated by the slow pace of change, but I do think it is, change is happening. Uh, I think, you know, the democratic policy agenda uh, was very much informed by a care-centric approach. Uh, it didn't succeed in the fall, but it was, it, you know, it really came out of the kind of the care research agenda. Uh, the OECD has put a lot of emphasis on what they call a well-being index. Uh, there's a lot of concern about inequality and the way inequality uh, uh, has toxic effects on communities. So I think it just takes a lot of accumulated research findings and a lot of persuasive translation of those research findings into ordinary language to persuade people of something that's actually pretty much common sense to non-economists, I, th I think. Uh, so I'm kind of hopeful. I think I do feel like there is momentum going in that in that direction. I mean, I, I've worked on these issues for more than 20 years, and I'm only now beginning to get some traction. So. That's one of the reasons I feel pretty positive about it. Yeah. I was recently like reading some of um, Bob Shetty's work on like social mobility. Yeah. And like he really talks about the importance of social networks in like high rates of social mobility. Yeah. And I was wondering if like you can really work with like the impact of like high rates of care like care work on social mobility or how those like. No, no I haven't, but I think that's a great angle. I think that's a great angle, and I'm. A, a big fan of, of Chetty's work uh, in that respect, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to kind of throw in some back question. I, I wonder, do you get the response that, you know, well, there's a lot of this stuff going on in the home, but it's hard to sort of fit it into an economic framework? You know, it's without being subject to the wage bargain and to competition, you know, how do we measure it more efficient? How do we think about its, its, its value? Um, because so much of economics is oriented around the use of price and market to you know, drive ideas about continuous productivity yeah. and enhancements and efficiency and all this. And, and it's presented by virtue of being outside of markets. I would guess that you both get skepticism of like all those hours shouldn't be spent or how many of them are valuable. And they're just yeah, they're just wasting time. time. They're just wasting time. And yeah. They're just, or, you know, the ladies probably watch right, well, the Well, market, first of all, you know? here's, I think this is interesting. There's a huge gender divide. Men, are, men academics are much more likely to make that objection. Women who've actually engaged in a lot of household management 
are just completely, I mean, for the most part, not a question. But here, strange allies, strange bedfellows. Uh, I, I mean, I think a lot, I'm not a fan of Gary Becker's um, methodology and his assumptions in a lot of respects, but one of the things Becker really did argue persuasively for was that people basic, basically try to use their time well. And they have a certain number of tasks that they want to perform, and they are doing the ones that seem most productive first, and they're comparing it with what they could earn in the market. And I think Becker has actually played a positive role in, in the discussion um, about it. Although, you know, a lot of my feminist friends throw up their hands in horror when I say that. Um, I think it's kind of cool that we could, like, actually, it's like martial arts. We could take <laughs> Becker, turn him against himself. Because Becker, you know, what's really clear in Becker is that, um, yeah, this work has value. It makes people happy. It creates utility. But there's nothing in Becker about benefits to anybody else. It's all about, you know, yeah, it's all about I only do this because it makes me feel good. Well, of course it makes me feel good, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't also generate benefits for my kids or my mother or my, or my neighbor. Clearly, they're getting something from it, right? So, um, I don't know. I'm getting carried away. Uh, any, somebody who hasn't spoken yet want to raise their hand? Yes. 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 Right. Um, this is actually like super not related to what we're talking about right now. Uh, this is really a clarification question. I was um, really interested in what you said about the gender wage differential and yeah. how it like kind of suddenly drops off once people commit to having family, yep. kids, etc. I was wondering if there's like a particular age in which this kind of clusters around because I feel like a lot of the arguments as to uh, popular ex explanations of the gender like wage gap is because of women choosing certain professions, and so you'd assume that, you know, the pain would... Yeah, 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 I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I hear, I hear you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of that literature is relevant, and it does matter when you take time out. It does matter, like, when you decide to have kids. And actually, the motherhood penalty, if you think about it, um, the motherhood penalty in earnings may not be that important if you're pooling your income forever, with a high earning man, okay? So uh, if you thought, if, if all marriages lasted forever and there was no threat of dissolution, this, the fact that you pay an earnings penalty wouldn't matter if every woman was married, right? But what happens is that women take time out of the, la of the labor market whenever they do, whenever they do it. I mean, the penalty might be higher if they do it earlier than later, or in some jobs and other jobs, but they do it, and it, it, it lowers their whole lifetime earnings trajectory. So what it, it does is that it increases the risk to them. And what it means is that if they do experience divorce or non-marriage, uh, they're very much at risk of poverty. So it's not so much, I think it's not, you know, I think there's too much emphasis in the literature on just the reduction in wages. I think what's really interesting is the way it kind of reduces women's bargaining power in the household because it means that the costs of ending the marriage become much greater for the, for the mother than for the father. And that means that they're going to keep on keeping on, in a sense. Uh, but there... I would just add another thing to what you were saying, which is that... Um, a lot of the literature on women choosing occupations is just the same. It, it justifies lower earnings the same way it justifies uh, not valuing care work. That is, oh, women just like those jobs. And they, they don't pay as well. They don't pay as well. If you go into health or education or social services, your, your earnings are going to be lower than if you go into business or finance. This is true. This is very true. You probably already figured this out, right? <laughs> so, um, so if you do those things, it's just because you must derive this incredible satisfaction that compensates you for the lower earnings. Okay, that may be true, 
but you're still producing something really valuable. It's just harder to grab it than if you go into finance. If you go into finance, your performance can be measured by your dollar, the dollar value of, of your accounts, right? And you're going to get a bonus based on that, okay? Guess what? If you're a teacher, you're not going to get that bonus. So, yes, women derive some satisfaction from lower paying jobs. It's still unfair that they're paid less than the value of their work, in my view. And that's what's missing from the mainstream labor economics literature. And by the way, in the long run, I think preferences are pretty, are pretty stable in the short run. Like if I start out wanting to be a teacher, uh, you know, I'm probably going to stick with it. Although maybe not in this day and age, there's actually a lot of people leaving teaching, right? But over time, what happens is that women see, oh, these care jobs pay a lot less. I'm not going into them. I'm going into finance. And so preferences shift in, in response. And what does it mean that we are living in a society where preferences to care for other people are penalized? Maybe, maybe, maybe we don't need to worry about it now. Maybe we don't have to worry about it next year. But do we really want to live in a society where people are socialized to believe that they're suckers if they decide to specialize in care work? I think it's a pretty you know, unpleasant prospect. Oh, I hate to end on such a negative note. Let's <laughs> let's end on something more positive. Yeah. I was curious about like all the different things that you mentioned about unpaid labor. I think and also it seems like it is there's a lot of allure also in, in this idea for me. It seems very attractive. I was curious why hasn't it caught on in your opinion? Like what are the main barriers of, of valuing people's work that if it seems like there is a huge population that might be in support of it, if it seems like you know you are saying that your work is valuable and it's inspirational, why has it not caught on more? Or at least it doesn't seem to be as much of a discourse as like, just in the day-to-day -day life. Well, uh, that's a great question. First of all, I think there's a tremendous amount of inertia in the world, ideological inertia. It's just hard to change the way people think about things. You know, think how long it, it took to get people to accept the fact that tobacco causes cancer. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, when I was a college student, that was, we were like, people are never going to accept this, right? It just took a really, really long time. Climate change, same thing. How, you know, climate denialism, really huge in the face of hurricanes, in the face of people having their homes destroyed, right? So there's a lot of and there is a lot of inertia, but there's also an ideological component, which is that a lot of people benefit from assuming that care work is really worth nothing and that it's just voluntary, and you know that it's more than compensated for in good feelings. Uh, and actually redistributing and reorganizing care work on a more equitable and efficient basis would cost some people a lot of money. You know, we would have to tax the finance industry to support the care industry. You think the finance industry is going to take that line down? No. We're going to invest heavily in uh, other points of view. Yes? I guess moving back to a follow-up question, a huge question is like, um, what, what do we do? What do we do? Yeah, well, because, like, I, I, I know. mentioned, it really resonates with me in a way because I'm taking an education economics class, and my professor keeps talking about, okay, there are people who want to be teachers. Maybe they love their job, but that's not a reason for them to get unfair pay. Yeah. Because, like, they need to... Yes, yeah. yes. So what, if, what, what, what do we do about that? <laughs> you got to fight for teachers. You gotta say teachers deserve better pay and better working conditions. Child care workers deserve better pay and better working conditions. Elder care workers deserve better pay and better working conditions. Families who are caring for, for dependent family members deserve more public support. We would all be better off if we did this. We would improve our collective capabilities. We would all gain. Uh, yes, some of the gains would be redistributed. Yes, it would be costly for some people, but Let's, uh, let's try to develop a more mindful and more sustainable system of care provision along with the process of developing a more mindful and sustainable um, ecological economy, right? 
I don't know what we what can we do? We can do research, we can talk to our neighbors, we can go to protests, we can write letters, we can uh, try to um, um, persuade our peers, we can write poetry, we can make art. Uh, gosh, there's so many different things that we can do. Um, and I don't think we should expect whatever we do to change things right away, but we should do it because we think it's intrinsically important to do it. You know, here's a positive ending. Um, there is really a paradigmatic change happening in evolutionary biology. Is anybody here a biology student? Well, for, for, for many years, biology has emphasized kind of survival of the fittest, that individual competition is what drives natural selection. And the group selection plays no role whatsoever. It's all individual competition. And now, in the space of the last 10 years, that theory has been almost completely displaced by a theory called the theory of multi-level selection. And what is the theory of multi-level selection? It's that, yes, individuals compete within their groups. But groups who have a lot of cooperators outcompete groups that don't have a lot of cooperators. It's like a team spirit argument, right? Uh, the team that works together is able to beat the team in which everybody is just competing with each other. And so this, is, this theory of multi-level selection is really, really important for the social sciences because this is what I'm talking about. Cooperation offers really important benefits uh, and it doesn't mean that competition isn't also important or that competition doesn't also have some positive implications, but it means that we live in a, human beings inhabit a very complex universe where sometimes we benefit by being entirely selfish, but a lot of the time we benefit by tempering our selfishness on behalf of the group that we're a part of, which has a huge impact on our individual success, right? Sometimes social scientists are like, act like they're allergic to biology, and so I often don't raise this point because people are like, essentialism, or something like that. But I think, you, you know, biology is really important, and evolutionary biology should really inform social science, and vice versa. Social science should inform evolutionary biology. So go forth and make that happen. That's my, those are my perfect. Anyway, I think we're, we're supposed to end, but I'll stick around if you want to talk more or you have, you know, something really pressing. I'll, I'll st I'm happy to stick around and talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much for being a good audience.